just do it separately, one okay. after the other. Yeah. Right. Is the, um, Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. And um, Tony, you're, you're not alone, actually, because I'm not an academic or Wordsworth scholar either. But I have spent about 40, just over 40 years, walking all the hills around here. So I kind of feel sort of honorary Wordsworth scholar from that point of view. Um, now, central premise of my doctorate uh, was that we experience the world directly through our senses, through our bodily contact with the world as we move or we walk through our environment. And as an artist, my own interest <coughs> lies in the, in the way that we reflect on this experience, the point at which what I'm calling embodied knowledge and cognition overlap, the way that we directly experience the world, um, weather, temperature, sound, space, touch, overlaps with our accumulated knowledge of the world through an understanding of the natural history of, uh, or of social history. This is my studio. Uh, and this is some of the kind of tools of my trade. My focus on colour is particularly because it's a medium which I think is both experiential and relative, so it kind of combines both uh, the intuitive and the cognitive. And at the same time, I, I, my um, uh, understanding of language, my interest in language, comes about, it comes about from both those ways as well, partly through a deeper understanding of what people are trying to say and, and, and interrogating the text, but also, as Tony was saying, through the asymmetric, as, asymmetric uh, view of it as well. Sorry. Um, I particularly like uh, the James Milroy quote, um, words are like other creatures. They have inscapes beautiful in themselves. Hopkins always suspected that the relation between words and things was not arbitrary. And one of the things I look at in a minute is, it isn't just words, but maybe the individual letters that are written by the writers have their own sense of inscape and create their own sense of landscape. My interest in embodied use of language led me to look at some of the early modernist poets, Pound and the Imagist in particular, and also um, poets and uh, artists, poets, concrete poets, who were influenced by the modernists, Gary Schneider, for instance, Ian Hamilton Finley, themselves been uh, influenced by Chinese and Japanese poets. I was curious about the way in which this influence has, in the 20th century, resulted in a literature that both pairs back the structure of the poem, plays with its visual form, but at the same time opens out its meaning. So this is an example, a lovely example, called Sea Poppy by Ian Hamilton Finley, two, two different versions of it. This is one of my own pieces, where the text, and this is 16 Birds of Allswater, where the text in the middle is actually the sound that the bird makes. I also became aware that whilst in the West, the visual representation of haiku to the printed word on the page puts it over as a kind of sparse and impersonal uh, approach, but haiku masters such as Bashu were both painters and calligraphers. And they didn't really see a distinction between either, and I, I'm really fascinated by that. Although their actual text often took the personal out of the poem, it remained nonetheless unspoken in the handwritten script. This is a lovely example by Chen Hong Shu, poem on wandering in the mountains. I, actually, I do like the landscape as well as the city. <laughs> um, my early attempts at, 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 kind of trans, at, at, at navigating this territory on the right-hand side, there's a piece. They're only small, these pieces. Um, this is a Spring Messenger Wordsworth. And it was, my interest was in the, um, the way that we can play around with language, and particularly the kind of colloquial references that might get closer to an embodiment of, of language. So Spring Messenger is actually, is actually a colloquial phrase for the small celandine. Um, just put uh, two more. I, I love these, uh, two more of these in a reference point. So the chance to explore the manuscripts of Dorothy Wordsworth um, gave me an opportunity to maybe push some of these ideas a little bit further. In her manuscript, she frequently refers to colour, to weather, to temperature, as well as making lots of references to local flora and fauna. She was clearly well aware of, the, of what was going on. Uh, in, the, in the many walks that she undertook with um, her brother and her friends, 
And I think that the handwriting in her journals are incredibly fluid and organic and, and, and expressive, but a perfect example of what I would see as the embodied formal use of language. Um, these are two examples of her um, diaries, of her journals. And th this was the first piece that I, I produced uh, on these. Um, tw Thursday, the 29th of April, 1802. And I lifted a, a, a little bit of text from each of the journal entries, a sound of water in the air. And uh, then I, I actually have lifted directly her, um, uh, the characters from the journals and placed them onto the, onto the text there. So again, this is the famous one, the daffodils. Um, so Thursday, the 15th of April, 1802, the wind seized our breath. That's Gow Barrow, Misty Morning, Daffodils is the actual text on the right hand side. But to me, they become landscapes in themselves whether you read the text or not. Uh, Monday, the 17th of May, 1802, snow and cold attacked me. And the second group that I've, I've been working on, it was how I actually began working on the series. I actually got the uh, manuscripts and just started playing around with the colours that you saw laid out on the table that I have in the studio. And I was just kind of gearing up to working with colours and how to use them. And I suddenly, got, I actually got really excited by the way that the colours interacted with the text and I started deliberately playing around with that. I'm very nervous, however, of interfering with the text or, you know, kind of destroying the integrity of it. But I, I did become quite excited by this, and so I've made, an, I made a number. And the intention is to uh, develop these um, so that the actual, you, th they would, there are two ways of doing this. You have the overlay um, with the colours on, then you have the text, and then you have the two together displayed like that. Or what I'd really like to do is to uh, develop a book where you had uh, the colours overlaid, and then in front of the text, and then page after page after page like that. So you can again see some of the, some of the works in the uh, studio there. So that's a very brief uh, look at, at one way of interpreting some of the text. Thank you very much.